Hey, I'm Mitch. And I'm Greg. And this is Side Note. A podcast where every episode we tell stories and debate a controversial subject. And then we research and splice in all the science and mind-blowing shiznit throughout so you are entertained while simultaneously learning. This week, we are talking about climate change. We start with some stories about visiting the Great Barrier Reef and heading to the Arctic with Greenpeace to do some activist work. And then in the second half, we're going to have a debate about climate change. But this week, it's going to be a little bit more of us just going off. Hey, what's up, Hi. Mitchell <laughs> Moffat? How you doing? Uh, Fine. Oh I'm my doing god! Just cool. fine. I took the dog to the dog park, and he's nice and chill right now. Wow! So this always starts just like with whatever mood Ernie's in. <laughs> yeah, true. Tired dog is us in a good mood. That's how they say it. That is <laughs> okay. So we're gonna start with our comment this week, and it's from Hugo Ricard. I'm picturing he's French. Uh, oh, at Hugo, I would have thought like Spanish. Oh, okay. Maybe he's a Spaniel. I don't know. <laughs> At Hugo Rick 31. Okay. He said, I love hashtag side note podcast, but they really need to figure out their sound levels. <laughs> in a time lapse of literally 10 seconds, it goes from mumbles to screaming in my ears. <laughs> so all I want to say is that. D- is there like, is one of us a bigger perpetrator of this? Do you uh, think? <laughs> I think me. I've, I've known to peak. I'm known. I famously peak. Um, <laughs> but I do feel like that people should know where we are right now, which is an old converted bathroom. And we're just doing our best. That's true. We are literally, we've talked about this many times, but we've turned it into like a foam padded room. So you have no excuse anymore, Greg. You got to put your levels out. You got to, you know, project properly so you're constantly at a good level. And then when you yell, bring it down a little bit. Okay. I literally don't even know what that means. Um, okay. <laughs> Moving I'm on. I'm sure I do it as well. <laughs> oh, what did we learn this week? Okay. Who wants to go first? You go first. Okay. So what did I learn this week? Okay. So I didn't learn this this week, but I did 23 and Me recently. And I have <laughs> more Neanderthal DNA than 87% of the world's population. Wow. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I kind of feel. It's very, yeah. It's very like apparent. Yeah. I have a big forehead. <laughs> like I don't really know that much about Neanderthals. But what I learned this week is that famously, they, because of like fossil records and looking at them, they predict that they had very loud, high pitched voices. And they were the first species to ever, like, wear clothes. And a lot of people don't know why they went extinct. And I'm like, maybe they went extinct because they were all gay. No. Because <laughs> they wait, love fashion. Did, wait, was that, a, was that a news report that came out about their high voices? How did yeah. you know that? Because <laughs> I mixed it all. I was reading about Neanderthals. So, yeah, they, they've, like, looked at their vocal cords and stuff. And they think they're loud pitch and high, kind of like mine. That's ridiculous. You a, you don't have a high pitch voice. It is you in have my like, head. You have, like, an incredibly low voice. Yeah, most people, <laughs> when they hear their voice, it's like, they're like, oh, like, like when I like it's higher or it's weird. Whenever I hear my voice, I'm like it's so much lower in my head. It's high, isn't it? Usually no, the opposite. I don't you know. You talk pretty low. I thought. Anyways, I Neanderthals, the the Your the people. extinct gays. Um, <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what did I learn this week? I learned about something called the my side bias, which like makes sense. Not going to lie. I'm not surprised. It's not that surprising, but they did a really cool test to sort of prove that when people have a preconceived notion or ideas about like have an opinion about something, they cannot deduce logical arguments properly. And so if you already have a belief in something and you hear someone present you with a really solid argument against my belief, against your belief, like you just won't change it, even if their argument is better. And they did this by posing like, you know, sometimes you take like quizzes or tests where they have like logical, like logical questions where you have to follow step one and two and then figure out if step three is true or false. Basically, they did that with lots of questions, and then every now and then they would put in, like, a political issue, like, about abortion. And even when people were really good at deducing logical puzzles, if they got to those kinds of questions, they, they would revert to their... They would always be more likely to choose the one that had to do with their opinion. So they <sighs> would say, like, that's not true or that's false, or that is true or that's false, more based on their political beliefs previously than their logical deducing skills that's really important information for right now and especially this episode talking about climate change and for us even like understanding that sometimes it's even it's not just about people who have different opinions than us you know what i mean like i feel like every time i hear this kind of news i'm like yeah those people are dumb (laughs) that i'm like wait it's also me what do you mean because you're saying that you don't necessarily change your opinion if you hear something of course yeah and it's like i i have a pretty strong opinion like we'll see today about climate change and i think it's right but maybe some real genuine arguments out there because of course there's a lot of crap ones and bad ones as well but maybe there are genuine arguments against certain aspects of it that i've been fully Fully, tone deaf to because i'm not willing to hear it oh that's scary in these divided current climate times (laughs) 
Story time. Story time. Story time. Story time. Today's topic is climate change. Da, 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 sexy. Mm, Ooh, so much fun. We're going to be all warmed Ooh, up and wearing so just a bathing suit. It's in no time. Um, Stories about climate change. Okay, where does that take you? I, I was thinking about the time that you and I went to Australia, we actually went, okay, so we we went down for like a science convention. Is that what it was? Yeah. Like some science event. Back, back when in we the said day. yes to everything. Yeah. We were like, yes people then. And we were like, I mean, at least actually, it, was cool. there. it was actually a really fun trip. Um, but during the sort of work trip, they also took us on like excursions all throughout Australia because they wanted to like show us the country while we were there. Um, or okay, at least one like thing I'll Coast. say about Australia as a Canadian, frustrating. Okay. Longest flight ever. <laughs> like you fly, we flew to LA, then we flew to Australia, you got off the plane and it's like, oh, I'm in a warm Canada where people have like it's weird totally. accents. I, like there was yeah. no culture shock at all. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it just feels like why did I sit in a metal tube yes. for so long to experience basically the same exactly. thing. But, but they had cool stuff. It is different in its own ways. I lived in Australia for half a year so I feel like I got to see a little more about what it's actually about. But anyway, we're okay, here we in Australia. It. Yeah, I'm like, mm, yeah. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we get to Australia and we're going on these trips and one of them is to go see the Great Barrier Reef. Do you remember this? Yes. So we actually like took a boat out. They bring you to a certain section. It wasn't... It was bougie. As far as I remember, like it wasn't a big part of the reef. It was like one contained section because they were trying to be like eco-friendly and not destroy the reef by bringing people to like all different parts of it. It was like... Here, we're going to bring you here. And they promised us that it was like good for the environment. It's, now the, I'm it's like, the only place you can really see it as a tourist. It's, right. a, main, it's a main hub. So of all tourism. these boats arrive yeah. there. And then you just can only go in like within a perimeter that's kind of blocked off for you. But we went in and it was actually so it's crazy. It's so cool. Like I think that's what now hearing about like the issues with the barrier reef and it bleaching and it dying it's like so sad to think like we saw this thing that actually blew my mind there's millions of animals we would like we saw a giant turtle that nobody else saw because we like went to the perimeter and i was like so scared because it was huge it was really cool and it was it was obviously because it 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 really feels like when honestly as a critical person when i got there i'm like i feel like a piece of shit like all these humans are just like gawking at this wildlife but it's so like we showed up in this like giant ass boat like it's not it doesn't feel that intimate. It's very touristy. Yeah. But I remember there is the boundaries, and we kind of were the first in that day. Right, we, we went like, to the boundaries. <laughs> and there was this huge sea turtle that literally swam towards us and then was like, well, that's a lot of humans. Fuck that. And turned around. <laughs> like, it was literally but I was like, I'm not glad. Yeah. You know when you see something that big you and you're scared. like, I actually, I don't need that to come near me because, yeah. well, like a snapping turtle the size of my arm could hurt me. I can't imagine what a turtle the size of me could do to me. It was funny because I, like, I remember coming up and like crying and taking off my goggles and you were literally just like, that was horrifying. I want to leave. And I was like, wait, I thought that was so cool. But did you not think it was scary? <laughs> no, I don't know. I just, just I thought it was going to like were pet also me. like, um, like tiger sharks at the bottom of it as yeah. well. And I, I'm really, really scared of sharks and just like anything in the water in general, especially whales. So I don't why know did why you go to the Great Barrier Reef? I don't know. I was there and you just <laughs> think you're supposed to do those things. But I remember seeing them and actually being like, always keeping my eye on the sharks. So one thing I would say that I've just etched into my memory is just the anchors keeping this like tourist building with like which had literally had like a cafe in it and stuff <laughs> in place were just these giant metal anchors that were slammed into the barrier reef that had bleached everything around it and it was like are we just supposed it's to not of, look at that? Because yeah. it makes me feel sick. Yeah, it's kind of the part where you're like, I'm, I'm aware of what's happening. But I don't and think there's it's... a domesticated golden retriever fish. Remember that? <laughs> Explain. Yeah, there is literally a fish that is the size of like four of me. It's huge. It's huge. I forget what the name of this fish is. It has a big it's bulbous kind of forehead. Like gross and ugly it's in so a way. Cute. It's cute. It's also disgusting and gross. Okay, <laughs> let's be real. But it comes up to you. Like as though you're at a petting zoo and just like wants to be it touched by you out. because I think they feed it so often and people yeah. maybe have treats and because and stuff. they want to make it's like they've definitely domesticated it because so many people go here and they want to interact with the fish. So worst case scenario, if you're on like a tour guide, they're like, okay, well, there's Freddy over there. Bring him over. He'll come over and everyone pets him and goes home feeling like they touched a fish. Right. They got they got something worth. But like, I wow. remember when we were like doing our own little snorkeling thing, he like wouldn't leave us alone. I was like, Freddy, like leave us alone. I want to look at some other fish. Yeah, but there's a would, point like, where it's like the golden retriever has been trained to beg for food yes. <laughs> and it won't leave us alone now. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Humans are weird. Humans are weird. So the fish that we are referring to is called Wally the Rass. 
So he's a Maori wrasse fish, also known as a humphead wrasse, because when you look at them, they literally have this giant hump on their head. They're really cute. They're really big, too. Like, I remember thinking, like, that giant fish is literally coming up and sliding up on me. Like, I guess this is kind of cool. It's literally like a puppy dog. I was super into it, but they can get up to two meters long and weigh 400 pounds. You can see tons of pictures of Wally the Rass online because he's a bit of an internet sensation because, yes, everyone has a photo with him because he loves you. Sadly, though, Wally's species, the Maori Rass, is classified as endangered, with their numbers declining in part due to habitat loss and degradation. And this is an important thing to know about. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority considers the greatest threat to the Great Barrier Reef to be climate change, causing ocean warming, and this increases coral bleaching. So coral bleaching is literally when the coral that you picture with just beautiful vibrant colors becomes white and it's when the coral polyps expel the algae that live inside them and this particular algae makes up 90% of the coral's energy they rely on it so when they expel these tiny creatures it leads to them starving and becoming bleached and since 2014 there's been a mass coral bleaching happening in these coral reefs and the hot it's because of the highest ever recorded temperatures plaguing the ocean these temperatures have caused the most severe and widespread coral bleaching ever recorded and coral bleaching is expected to become an annual occurrence as global warming continues. Corals will not be able to keep up with this increasing increase. Increasing increase? That's a double whammo. But you get what I'm saying. The ocean temperatures are increasing and the coral won't be able to keep up. There are some plans put in place, including this thing called the Reef 2050 plan with Australian and Queensland's governments trying to help. But what they're trying to do is think of like long-term sustainability and like reef restoration, trying to get rid of the predatory starfish, which you actually see when you're there is all these starfish. There's so many of them and they actually go and you see how they kind of eat along the coral and behind where they've moved, you see that it's like white and bleached. So there's an issue with how many starfish are actually like alive and taking over like a pest. But what they're not really able to control is climate change, which is due to greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore this plan, which is hopeful and it's good that people are trying, experts doubt will be able to stop the fact that it's the ocean's temperature increase due to our human impact that is going to cause the coral reefs to be fully bleached likely by 2050. Um, also, the last thing I remember about this, I don't, you probably remember this. What? So Greg's really sensitive to the light and sunburns and when we got oh, out, he Fully, we had these kind of like pseudo um, suits on. So like they, they were like cropped. They were like scuba suits, but they were cropped at our legs. So he had like the biggest burn on the back of his legs <laughs> only because we were like mostly snorkeling. And I wasn't thinking we about it because it was a sweat. It was a it was like an, a wet suit that was a t-shirt and shorts. Yeah. So I put sunscreen on my face, on my arms, but I forgot about the backs of my legs. And all you're doing is snorkeling with yeah. your legs exposed. <laughs> and and I lit, it was the worst sunburn I've ever had. Yeah. I still have pictures of that. And it, I actually thought you had like a third degree burn. I couldn't was sit because it, like, it was like crinkle my skin every time I sat. Mm -hmm. Climate change, we all gonna burn. <laughs> so my story is about another one of our privileged, we are very privileged people who've traveled many places for our job. Because this sure. is another example of that. So Mitch and I worked with Greenpeace in order to help bring awareness uh, to the specific Inuit community in Northern Canada that was fighting the National Energy Board of Canada. It was a really interesting case. I'll get more into it later. But essentially, we had to fly to a Iqaluit which is a city in Nunavut, which is just, if you're listening to this, picture the Arctic. Mm -hmm. It's like the New York of the Arctic. <laughs> but, but in my head, I was like, we're going to go, like the epitome of what people think of Canada. I'm like, we're going to go and it's going to all be snow. And like, we're going in the summer, but I still was just like, brought so it's many warm snow. clothes. I was <laughs> like, I'm going to the Arctic. So we land and we get out of the plane. And I was, I was honestly like taken aback by I walked out and then I was like I'm so hot like it's like, really hot it yeah. was so hot the sun was so strong and it was a weird time the sun didn't set at this time so it was like kind of late in the day and the sun was blaring and I remember we were just holding our backpacks sweating like we're in a cat like this is not what I pictured yeah. at it was all. also a mix of like uh, I, I think calling it the New York of the North is like a little I bit was of a misnomer. I was, a, I was but like the, it's a way bigger city than yes. I thought it was going to be. But also at the same time, when you get out of the airport, it's like you literally just immediately oh, yeah. walk out of the onto airport. a dirt road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. then we just like awkwardly walked to our hotel. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, no, we went to a kebab place. Oh yeah, a Lebanese but restaurant. Went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I thought it was just like it was a lot different than I expected uh -huh, for sure. And like there were 
hot, hot, like ten story brick, not brick, but ten story building. Yeah, it was actually really pretty. Like they, had, the whole city. I think because there's so much government work there that yeah. there actually is quite a lot of like activity that goes on there, whether or not it's like. I don't know. Like it just there were tons of buildings, and I have a couple of friends that work there for government jobs. So I think that and obviously a lot of that climate change affects the Arctic more drastically than other places because it's so cold. But I was just like, if everyone could have this experience, you'd be really surprised. Like obviously climate change is happening. People were like, yeah, this is really hot. Like True. ten years ago, this would never happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, they would they, talk we about sweating. how they would like hunt along the ice because it was frozen enough where now it's too dangerous yeah. to do those kind of things. So that kind of bleeds into then what happened. So we got into a plane. A sm- oh my god, the most horrifying plane. It only ever. it was like a like how many people were on that plane? Like like s- six, six or seven. And actually, what's really interesting too is that uh, indigenous people who live in Inuit communities that live in parts of the north have to have their babies in a calloway so do you remember we were mm-hmm. on a plane with someone who had had their coming baby in a calloway coming back with their brand new baby to clyde river where we were going and when we got off the plane she was there with her new baby and meeting all of her family mm-hmm. for the first time that was i was like i remember crying it was, it was like so really emotional, emotional. Yeah. and it was that's an interesting thing you don't think about is like healthcare in those scenarios like the canadian free healthcare system still has to work for these people mm-hmm. and then the fact that they had to fly was like I don't know. It was like I was like, "What's happening here?" Then when we got there and saw that the family was all there, so excited to see their kid. And she and would have grandkid. been missing. Like she would have gone much earlier than when she was expected to have her baby. Like you're not really supposed to travel when you're pregnant at a certain point. So she probably hadn't seen her family for months. Yeah, that was that was an interesting start to everything. But then, yeah, the Clyde River was was fascinating. So this this uh sm- like I don't even know how many people were there. I think it was like fifty. No, not even fifty thousand. We should look. Oh no, up. way less. Yeah, and there was. They took on the National Energy Board to say that they couldn't seismic blast in their waters. And seismic blasting is a way that uh, energy companies use to, like, essentially use, like, audio, loud, loud audio frequencies to see how deep the bottom of the ocean is and then decide figure out if there's oil if there's oil there and if they want to drill there mm-hmm. so it's like and it's like horrible when you even see videos of it it's like it works well for the whole greenpeace thing where you, if you if there's a human emotional reaction to what's happening here yeah there's like an explo- it's like yeah you like and, see the explosions going on underwater and it messes with whales which is again narwhal whales is what they eat and they need sea ice to hunt these narwhal whales and that's the big thing they keep talking about is like the sea ice is melting we can't even get to the whales anymore mm-hmm. so that's like it's like a food scarcity issue but the main issue is that we saw in the transcripts that the government did not properly educate and like get the a-ok from these communities the way that they said that they did Mm -hmm. and so in the end when they took it to the supreme court of canada they did vote in favor of clyde river which was amazing because we obviously helped to bring awareness to this but they worked so hard Mm -hmm. to fight like it's the epitome of like the whole like David and Goliath's story. Clyde River argued that they were not consulted properly about what seismic blasting would do to their waters. And when you actually looked at the transcript, they weren't. Mm -hmm. Whereas the National Energy Board was trying to say that they were. And it was like really sneaky, weird language they were using to try and be like, it's okay. Nothing's going to happen to the whales. Like everything's going to be okay. It was really quite evil. So I think it's just, it's a weirdly happy ending in the end. And I think the people of Clyde River were surprised that so many people cared. And obviously like being there, And speaking to them, it was amazing because it's a small group of people who really believed in something and took on the big government. And I think in this world of like climate change and news, it was an interesting, like good story about how important these things are. And the Supreme Court of Canada, again, that's how you set precedents precedence for things moving forward so the hope is that it does show the legitimacy and power that indigenous people have on their land to make sure the canadian government is consulting them properly the story of clyde river is so inspiring and again and again indigenous communities are really leading the way on fighting climate change and when greg and mitch were recording this episode i thought okay i really want to highlight the activism of other communities particularly the work done around pipelines that transport oil from location to location. For example, the activism at Standing Rock around the Dakota Access Pipeline, or here in Canada, the work done to block the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. But literally the same day we recorded this, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the federal government has no duty to consult with Indigenous people before drafting laws, even those that might affect their constitutionally protected treaty rights. To be clear, this is different than consulting on projects like seismic blasting. 
Currently, the government still needs to do that, but not for laws. So this court case was actually brought forward by the Mikisu Cree First Nation in 2012, when the government brought forward the Omnibus Budget Bill, which amended protections to waterways and the environment. And the Mikisu Cree argued that they needed to be consulted on the changes because it reduced their established right to hunt, trap, and fish on their traditional territory. The Supreme Justices argued that having Indigenous people consulted on laws would slow things down too much, and that the approach would threaten parliamentary supremacy. Okay, number one, Parliament should work for the people. And two, when all nine justices are white, that sounds a lot like white supremacy. And that you are saying the constitutionally agreed upon rights of indigenous people simply do not matter to you. One justice argued that the process would be highly disruptive to parliament's work. In my opinion, that is what we freaking need, disruption. If we don't shake up the business as usual way of doing things, we do not stand a chance against climate change. We were also on that trip with Emma Thompson. Do you remember? Obviously, yeah, obviously I remember. <laughs> but also Emma Thompson. It was like it was funny because everyone had such different reasons why they loved Emma Thompson. She's so iconic. Yeah, but most her. people, it was Nanny McPhee, which oh, really? I haven't seen. Oh, because we're a little bit older. But yeah, all the kids who lived there were like freaking out because Nanny McPhee be like, was Nanny there. Nanny McPhee's here. <laughs> like they literally, like the young enough kids were like didn't understand it wasn't a movie. It was so cute. And then I, I just am obsessed with her because she's the angel in Angels in America. Mm-hmm. And I remember I told her that I was like, it meant I didn't realize the director had recently died, and she got she was so amazing. She was so like true. She's exactly what she is in like interviews. She's so funny, mm-hmm. and so like. I'm really like passionate. I really like connects with you even yeah. when you don't know her that well. Like yeah. she looks into your soul. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, like I love. And she drank gin out of like a mug. I'm like you are so <laughs> British. I love you. But she like I remember her like getting emotional. She's like that director. Like Angels in America meaning so much to queer people now is like so important. And I was just like, oh my god. <laughs> like she was <laughs> Thank very. You. She was. It was so cool to see her partaking in something like that. Like with all of her energy. And I just yeah, she's a pretty amazing activist slash actor. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be having our debate about climate change. So in our debate section, Mitch and I usually pick a side and we debate each other, but when it comes to climate change, as people who are obsessed with science and interested in reality, <laughs> we are on the same side. So when we're on the same side of debates, which has happened before with like sex ed, we're going to call this segment Go Off. We're going to go off, honey, because we're angry. No, we just, we're just going to, we have roughly the same points. So we might as well just get into this, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, so I think what we should talk about first is the IPCC report because that's sort of the reason that we started to want to make this episode and it's in the news a lot lately, which is very important. Yeah, okay. So let's, if you haven't heard, let's kind of go over what this is. It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And what do they look at, Greg? Well, it's okay. So it's it's the United Nations Scientific Advisory Board is maybe something that people could like understand more. It's like the United Nations being like, okay, we need to listen up. Mm. So whenever you hear people talk about like, uh, you know, we've reached one degree of, of the world temperature above a certain level. What they're talking about is above pre-industrial world temperature. Mm-hmm. So it's like in the late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution happened. And really what happened is we started to warm the planet extremely quickly because of the way we were deciding to burn fossil fuels mm-hmm. and make energy for ourselves. So when we say 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees above, like we're talking about above, like, 1850s. Reference. Yeah, exactly. in reference to, like, that point where it started to go a lot faster because our industries and capitalism and everything was booming all at once. Yeah, and I think that's important to know. I think a lot of people, like, forget what that even means. So there was this big talk, I think, I don't know, people would remember it from, like, four years ago about the Paris, like, climate, like, 
Accord is what it was called, the thing that Trump pulled out of. And they were all talking about two degrees Celsius. So two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial world temperatures is what everyone was freaking out about. But recently, a new uh, study and paper in the UN, they got together and they were like, okay, if we actually get to 1.5 degrees above, which is going to be by 2040, so mm-hmm. that's in a lot of people listening to this lifetime. Like there's you know, Most, I imagine. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's when we actually have to really start thinking it's going to be detrimental like most of the coral reefs are going to be gone Mm -hmm. there's going to be in like so many people who are displaced when it comes Mm -hmm. to like climate refugees like food shortages wildfires coastal flooding drought like a lot of these impacts that we actually are already starting to see today they've just come up with a report that by the way there was 91 scientists from 40 countries who had analyzed 6,000 studies on these things and came to the a consensus that you know by 2040 even when even if we like take severe action we can expect some really severe results um and that's why it kind of blew up like we're not saying it's the end of the world by 2040 but these things are going to become more and more extreme at a lot at a, at a rate a lot faster than what was initially proposed and i think that's what's important and why we're talking about this now why you honestly if you're listening to this need to be like 2040. I know that mm, date. 22 I will years. Be alive. I bet some people listening to this podcast aren't even 22 years old yet. You know, that's a whole, like, that, that's going to happen really fast. And so, so some of the things I think we need to go off about is the fact that people, it's the reason it's so scary is because politically, if you don't vote for science and if you, we really don't start to make sure that we have. I, I really think it's up to politicians to regulate this because I know that we are not going to be able to do it ourselves. If people don't listen to this report, it's going to be even worse. And I was just reading here, like rich comp, rich countries had like promised to like put investments into poorer countries to help them with mm. the fact that like how to like make Invest their energy greener yeah. and how to actually like deal because it's going to be those poor countries that are going to suffer first. It's going to be create an even more of a divide economically. But the United uh, states and australia pulled out of this like really large uh like like it was essentially an economic infrastructure so that their money could go into these other nations who are going to suffer first from a lot of what these is wrong with issues. australia i didn't well, know <laughs> red flag <laughs> um, <laughs> why did they do it i mean yeah it's really frustrating because we want to put our faith in like politics because it has to implement these things that as a society we can all start like you know, it, it is hard as an individual. We can talk about later things that individuals can do in their own lives. But as a society that is, like, addicted to capitalism, buying, consuming, we obviously need higher level laws to help create the way that we consume things in this world. And so it's really frustrating that, especially in America, but all over the world, there's a lot of concerns about, like, the new um, president in Brazil. Is it president or prime minister? Yeah, yeah, the president in Brazil. Um, like, he is an anti-climate or he's a climate change denier. He wants to open up the Amazon literally for just to like a lot cut more. it all down. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, that's a bit of an exaggeration to say cut it all down, but he wants to make to take away regulation to open up more of it to grow. Cattle. Which is a huge issue in terms of climate change. And that's part of the problem is politicians are so intertwined with money and know that they need a lot of money, especially in like the Western world. You use your money to get elected. And if you're going to like run on a platform that is like maybe not anti-economy because in our minds we're like no you can promote renewable energy and that's like an amazing new economy that's going to be a future but i think in a lot of politicians mind they're thinking like we have to go and tell all these people who work in sort of traditional or legacy industries like coal and oil that we're going to start shutting down their jobs and those are huge industries that hold a lot of money that give a lot of politicians money and so, so yeah and that to get to go on that like to this 1.5 degrees celsius by 2040 is if we continue the way we are right now. And I think, mm-hmm. so So one interesting thing to think about is like to maybe not get there by 2040, to postpone it literally by like 20 years or something, coal as an electricity source needs to drop from currently, it's 40% of how we get our electricity in the States and in Canada, but it needs to drop to only one to 7% of like the production of electricity and renewable energy needs to increase from currently it's around 20% of how we get electricity to 67%. So those are very obvious numbers for you to think about. Okay. Coal needs to decrease. Mm -hmm. Renewables need to increase. So if you are hearing your elected like president or prime minister talking about doing things the opposite Mm -hmm. way, then things are going to actually get worse. And right now, this 20, 40, 1.5 degrees Celsius increase is if we continue the way they are right now, not getting worse. Right. And so I think it's like it's like this is if we actually think uh, just stop where we are right now. And it, there's a lot of people, including Trump. So this is <sighs> OK. <laughs> Don, <laughs> Don, Take your breath. Breathe. Like Donald, it is insane that 
climate change denial is like a political issue. Issue. Yeah. And okay, so I've I've read about this, and there was a real. It's it's really convoluted, but it was like after the war. It's 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 almost it's an episode on itself. You mean like why is it a political yeah, issue? Yeah, it and literally not just... became a political issue. It was like it was like decided that it would be used to help. It was all around like the nuclear issue with Russia and like okay. a way to sort of like have science like intermingle. That they there was just like this. It was a literally a decision made by politicians to use it as a tool for an election. Again, I don't want to get into it because it was actually so confusing, mm-hmm. but the point is that it was deci- it was decided at it's some like point that strategy. climate change was going to be a strategy and a way to actually like like create like a uh, momentum around something that it's like no, there there is no debate here. Mm-hmm. It's horrible that we even have to sometimes say like oh, we're going to be on the same tide be- side because we uh, believe in climate change. It's like no, you don't believe in it. Mm-hmm. It's real. It's 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 gl- it's just frustrating that and I get I don't even know how to talk about it sometimes because I'm like it's not not a thing and so, and Donald Trump literally said about this IPCC report in quotes I want to look at who drew it you know like which group drew it like he's trying to not just admit that it is I don't even know admits the wrong word he's yeah. just he's denying it and well it's like also it's a simple question it's a simple answer I mean like. 40 different countries came together to do this and looked at 6,000 studies, okay? It, like, why can't not someone just say that to him? I mean, they obviously but, but could, they, and he's like have. a moron enough yeah. to not listen. But and I mean, it's about his base, riling up his base. Yeah. And that, that's the scary part. And, like, a hurricane hit Florida literally on the day that he was campaigning for this guy named Lou Barletta, a climate change-denying Republican congressman running for Senate. So there's literally hurricanes that are directly impacted by climate change that are getting worse, causing flooding is going to be one of the biggest issues by 2040 that are going to increase exponentially every year. Wildfires in California, we see them right now. already. Drought in Europe and the Middle East and California. It's like, if you live in America, you are already experiencing the beginning of some pretty severe climate. And all the money has to go to building back Texas after these things happen. And he's, you know, he shows up and he's like, we're so sad for the families and this state. But it's like, no, you are not. Like, Mm -hmm. because you are not taking any action at all and it's horrifying because again all of this 2040 information that came out last week is if we continue the way that we're at right now and if we don't get worse Mm -hmm. and that's just scary because politically i'm like i can see it getting worse right now yeah there's even like links and studies showing that the civil war in syria can be linked to severe drought uh worsened by climate warming climate which drove syrian farmers to abandon their crops and flock to the cities so there's like major political implications not just like oh it's going to be a really hot summer or oh it's going to be a crazy cold winter it's like the world is becoming destabilized because it's like even in the arctic the ice is melting at greater rates in the in the summers, which impacts the whole way that all of the water in the ocean moves. Okay, so when that and cold, acidification, and yeah, all, everything yeah. about Thermohaline, it, and it's like yeah. that doesn't just impact ocean animals; like that impacts how the air flows and how our everything, like how we create agriculture, like the temperatures that are required and the moisture that is required to impact the way that we feed the entire planet is going to be impacted. And the frustrating thing, again, as someone who lives in Canada, which is one of the worst countries in the world when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. capita as well, right? Like as individuals, we As individuals, we consume so much because we're a wealthy country, but also because of the tar sands and because of the way that we Mm -hmm. economically are tied to oil, we are one of the worst in the world of greenhouse gas emissions, worse than the States. And it's it's like, so again, I don't want people to think that Canada is this like almighty place because it is not. It is like... Oh, it is. It's just as bad, even though we don't have a Trump elected right now. Our economy is so intertwined with oil and we just get to fly by under the skies that we're not like a huge right. part of the issue. But we are wealthy. America on a global scale is wealthy, even though they have really low literacy rates and they're literally a broken democracy, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but but it's these rich countries which are doing the most damage. And it is very obvious. It is like poorer countries that are going to suffer first from the lack of food and crop yields that are going to happen from this happening Mm -hmm. like they are the people who aren't going to have the infrastructure to get the food to them when they need it and also it is literally island countries and countries that are really close to the let's the sea level rising becoming Mm -hmm. issue that are going to be the most affected literally they're going to be the climate refugees and they are small countries or yeah small economies they live on islands and it's unfair that we get to sit on this big rich massive land and literally ruin and contribute to climate change the most and it's these other people who are going to suffer and as humans and as a species linked the thought that we are just willing to allow those people to die and be displaced at 
so we can like continue mm-hmm. to live. It's so sad. And if you think that your economy is above that, and if or if you're like a freaking vegan, I don't know. No, being a vegan is amazing thing for climate change. But you know what I mean? Like, there's so many things that people get riled up against, like right. in their acute space. That's a, I really feel bad that I brought vegans because actually. No, really, that's an I amazing that. contributor to but, like cutting down on waste. Yeah, and what climate. I meant was like, you know what I mean? Like right. those so things if that we you care so, so much, much about some things, but it's like, like humans why, are going to suffer. Yeah, like can we focus on that? You're right. Like maybe vegan isn't the best example, but I know what you meant. Like, yeah, like those getting things. getting so worked up over like a gorilla dying or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean? <laughs> um, this is, I came across this quote this morning and it was just, it was just simple. Was, I don't know how to explain to you to care about people. Like I, it's just at that point where it's like, okay, I get that some people it's out of sight, out of mind, but like all those climate refugees are going to have to go somewhere. And that's going to be an issue that e- is a burden for everyone. All that food that's impacted, yeah, you might not see it now, but maybe by the time you do see the impact and your avocado costs like $20 per avocado, it's going to be too late to reverse that. Like you're not, we're not going to be able to go back. And I think that's part of what this report it's not trying to scare tactic people. Like, yeah, they actually had something in it that was like, by 2040, the effects are going to be so de- de- like disastrous and devastating. We aren't going to even be able to like cope. And they actually like that was the original draft, and people found it. But then they they realized they took it out because they're like, yeah, we don't we want to just be, like, yeah. Def- and it's not. We're not trying to say like it's apocalyptic. The world's going to be on fire. But it's like we're going to hit a point where. If you don't, if we don't change things now, when we aren't seeing the effects in the rich countries, it's going to be too late by the time we are, because we're the last ones to be feeling the impact of that and contributing the most and contributing the most. So, uh, it is true. That is interesting, though. It's like, how do you get people to care? And that is, we have a lot of like episodes on ASAP Science, sort of thinking about this right now. Like, how do you actually make an impact? Because <laughs> statistically, it's shown that just yelling about climate change, which we're doing right now, doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> But it's like it's just our little echo chamber with everyone here. Yeah, know? but it also I do think it's like uh, hopefully maybe some people can like hear this passion because even this, even this report as again two people who are affluent and who live in Canada we are huge contributors yeah, to it, climate change. We have to check ourselves. Yeah, this is helping me even check myself and my like microcosm of the world, and it's like that's what we need to do. But we also need to take action politically. We need to vote for science. Yeah, and make and it be not aware. a political issue in that sense. Like <sighs> I, it shouldn't yeah. be bipartisan. Like. I don't care. It, I, I would be happy if there was, like, in my writing, a conservative who was, like, pro-fighting climate change. And if a liberal person wasn't, uh, that would be a big issue for me where I'd be like, okay, maybe that's who I need to support. Like, I don't think this should be it should be a bipartisan um, initiative all across the world. And, like, this, the, it's an acute economic issue, I think, a lot of the time for people who are trying to deny climate change or trying to not, like you know, create a carbon tax. It's like, it's just so cute. It's it's like, I think the good thing about this report is what it makes you do, do with the date of 2040 is you start to go, okay, where am I? Okay, mm. I'm 50. Like, I have kids. Okay, wait, are my kids even having kids? Mm-hmm. And what is the life going to be like for them? If you, if you zoom out a little bit and you think of, like, the time scale of life on Earth, not to just be right now or not to be the next few months, but really think about how you want the legacy of humanity to be at this current time, it can maybe help you, like, experience a bit more compassion and, and understand we need a carbon tax mm-hmm. we all need a freaking carbon tax that is so important and in canada they're reneging on that and it's like that is so and even scary. when there are carbon taxes it's like even so trump's brought it down to like seven dollars per ton obama had it at 50 but the, i think this report or i'm not sure if it was this report another was saying if we don't change that to being like 135 dollars to fifty five hundred dollars per ton like no one will change the carbon tax isn't really it's doing too minimal anything like, uh, because it's not the actually companies stopping. are so they're like oh yeah we can afford that we wow. can afford to waste because we still make more money it, it needs to be implemented in order to actually deter people from creating so much waste and one last thing i kind of want to say is it's important not to just think that people that don't believe in climate change or organizations that aren't fighting for climate change are stupid. Yeah. Like it's an easy out. I think for people who are in this sphere to be like, yeah. they're just dumb and they don't understand it. It is. I think we need to be a little bit more compassionate. It is going to take a lot of work. Like, I'm not saying we need to, like, overthrow capitalism, but then we need to use it to really start promoting, like, industries that can change the world. And there are people doing that in this world. And that's the most frustrating part to me where it's like there are politicians who could benefit from being like, we're going to become the leaders in green energy. And that's going to revolutionize the world. That's Germany. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be the future of everything where everyone needs to come to our country for these technologies that we've already developed. I just feel 
there is some weird disconnect. Don't just call people stupid, but start talking about the ways in which we can use the capitalist society to actually benefit this initiative, I think. And I think it's important to, like, we also, again, on ASAP Science went through, like, when Trump was elected, and they, like, doomsday videos that were doing really well, but then they started to not do as well because I don't want this to just be, like, a doomsday conversation, like, humans are pathetic and, like, we're not going to be able to do this and all this, which it can really sometimes become almost, like, depressing. Like, I don't want to hear about climate change because I have to go to work today and I have mm-hmm. to, like... And so I think there is hope. There really is hope. Like, <clears throat> this is about being knowledgeable. It's about talking to your friends and family about it. But we're humans. We are capable of amazing things. We are so intelligent. We have gone through so many things and come out of them like progressing and getting better. And I think that very much can happen. It just needs to start now. Mm-hmm. And even countries like China, like they're they're feeling the effects of climate change like in an awful yeah. way as well. We don't hear about it as much in our they media. They see it. In they their see it in their cities basis, and their yeah. smog and all these issues. And they are starting again. One of the biggest economies and biggest contributors to climate change. They're starting to really think of ways to scale it back, increase renewables. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even if that that will be a help to the West, because they are obviously know that they're a huge economy, the mm-hmm. economy of the future. If they see them doing it, it could maybe help people. Hopefully, be like get in line. Mm-hmm. And there are people. Europe is they're doing amazing things, and we are going to do this but it's not going to be by being complacent yeah so and okay so then what can just lastly like what can individuals do i mean i I think people feel like it's so non-consequential when you just like don't waste as much or you try to take transit or you you know and i know it's easy for us in a city so like not everyone can take transit but just like think about the simple ways that you can and it can be really fun it can be really fun it's like if you just do do some research, yeah, like we always, I always think about transit. I bike everywhere, I walk everywhere. We, but we, we bought live a, in a major we bought city. a car, which yeah. was it. Well, we leased a car, but that's still a really huge issue. Exactly, Even the yeah. making of that car, but I don't like. I do my best to not use it, and th- even though. Again, we're admitting we you, we are huge yeah, we're issues. we're all part of the system. You can still have those things in your day-to-day life and make them not a burden. Make them something that you take pride in mm-hmm. and make them something that you're just like excited to tell your friends about. Laugh about it. You don't have to be like condescending and be like, oh, you're doing something wrong. Right. Even if it's like sitting, like like bringing your cup to a cafe where your friend you're meeting your friend for coffee and all of a sudden you just go up, you get your coffee in your mug that you brought, they get the paper mug, whatever. You sit down, they might be like, Oh, what's up? You'd be like, Oh, I'm just I'm just doing this. Yeah, it's one simple yeah. thing. Why not? You know, if you remember, you remember. Don't beat yourself up when you forget. But I think ultimately, like you said before, the most important thing will be political action in terms, yeah, exactly. in terms of like not necessarily just political but in terms of societal differences like implementing strategies to change the way we consume and then being open to that if you mm-hmm. hear that a politician or someone is trying to regulate this under the understanding that the future is going to be scary if we don't if you hear about your politicians trying to listen to this and make a difference be excited about that be with them with that and don't combat when people are trying to use the fact that climate change is going to be devastating in our lifetime to try and make political decisions and think of it like compound interest for people who are interested in money and good investments like you do it now you get way more later than if you like wait 50 years when it's so much more dire like the earlier we start the better don't laugh at the simple things that other people are trying to do and just be part of the system that can promote yeah we might have to sacrifice a little bit in terms of like maybe we're paying a little more tax or maybe the money's going to something that there's not an immediate benefit to you but it's going to have that compound interest which will make your life better in the future trust people people love a beach people love waterfront you know that's like what everyone lives for they work hard to go to a beach somewhere it's like if you want to enjoy waterfront in (laughs) gens across the board in your lifetime you need to make sure that that sea level Mm -hmm. does not rise to the way that it might and devastate so many all coastal lines yeah Yeah, there's not not going to be beach anyways what up <laughs> okay, that felt okay. cathartic a little bit. I'm yeah. like, was that for us? I hope people like listened and nodded no, along. You and feel, I feel, I feel like more politically motivated than ever before because these kind of things. I'm like, uh, not that I necessarily want to be in politics, but I think I just need to be more active in saying what yeah. is important to me. And I think this kind of stuff matters to like lots of young people, lots of old people as well. But we all need to band together to really make a difference. Yeah. Like organization of people makes a huge difference. That's what we need to start doing to just have our voices be heard and have people represent us who are like, yes, that's what is going to be priority for us. Okay. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're proud of you for listening and we're proud of you for all the like little steps that we are all taking and trying to take in this specific situation. You can read the IPCC article or Google it and get it like 
get information about it in a more simple way. I actually started reading the article and it's it's a tough read. Yeah. It's very scientific, but there's lots of people like who have put it in layman terms yeah. and it, it's just really interesting and it is motivating and I just, you know, I'm hopeful for the future, but we need to act now. Thanks for listening. Um, you can let us know what you think, actually, with the hashtag side note podcast anywhere you do it. Uh, you can follow us both. I'm at Mitchell Moffat and Greg is at Whale Watch Me, please. And we will uh, see you guys next week. Bye.